This is Microphone Check, hip-hop from NPR Music. I'm Franny Kelly. I'm Ali Shaheed Muhammad. And I'm Hank Shockley. Hank Shockley. <laughs> what up, Hank? I'm good, man. How you doing? I'm good. How's everybody? Hanging in. Well, yeah. Hanging in. We're here at South By. What, the, what does that mean? I'm tired. Oh, yeah. He's tired. I mean, I met Hank Shockley out of nowhere, like, at 10 o'clock at two hey, nights right? ago, yes, something like yes. that. He came up, he's like leaning on the fence. Hi, I am Hank Shockley. I produce for Public Enemy. And I was like, I know who you are. <laughs> what can I give you? <laughs> it's funny because, you know, you got to, I have to always preface that because I, you know, what else am I going to say? Because people are like, well, who? Yeah, right, what, whatever. But uh, yeah, and, and uh, you helped me out, you know, and I said, look, she said, I want you to come to this show that I'm doing. <laughs> and I didn't even know that she was doing it with you. Oh, right. I, did, I was just, she said, she said, I thought it was just her, you know, <laughs> her show. I was like, yeah, okay, I'll come by. I thought I was going to say a few words on the camera. and then. Was, <laughs> well, that's nice of you. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, then, then when I, we found out, and it was like, I was like, oh. Yeah. It's a real deal. Yeah. Happy Incredible. to have you here, man. And thank you. Appreciate it. Do you What's... remember when you guys first met? Sorry to cut you off. Hmm. I don't remember. Oh, you know something? We don't, none of us remember how we met because uh, at that time, right, it was more like, it was more of a synergy thing. Yeah. We were kind of like, it's like each, we flow around so many different people then. Yeah, the same people. Or we were trying to get in your area of being mm-hmm. noticed, really. <laughs> yeah. I well, mean, well I, I remember that I was, I was working with the Jungle Brothers mm-hmm. and I was trying to secure them a deal at, at uh, Warner Brothers. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, so I knew Africa, and then I got to uh, Chris Mm -hmm. through there, you know. And Chris gave me the tape of you guys when you guys were first starting out. And it was was the most amazing stuff I've ever heard. And I think there was like five songs on there. And and it's a great memory. (laughs) And but but you know you come on you that's something you can't forget because the the, it, it was it was a cassette. You know, and, it, and I remember, and, I, and, and when I listened to it, it had, you know, I, I can't remember all the songs, but I know Left My Wallet was on there. Yep. And, 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 and Bonita. And Bonita. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And, and that, that, those, that tape, I listened to that, was like, I was amazed. I said, let me get this to Russell, because, you know, I figured, well, you know, maybe I get to Russell, I can produce it. <laughs> 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 I, or help produce it, or, or do a song, whatever, you know. <laughs> But, but the songs were already tight, you know, and, and I took it to Russell, and he was like, nah, they're not rapping hard enough. And I was like, are you kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> but then that's when I knew that, you know, he's Uncle Russ, we love him, and everything else. But that's when I knew that, you know, he, that's when I knew it was, it was going to be a hit. Interesting. Really? How do, yeah. you, how do you mean? Well, because, you know, I, I, used to, I used to look at Russell and Rick, and I used to play them off of each okay. other. It's like, if, if I'll take a record to Russell, and if Russell hated it, it was a smash. Mm-hmm. Everybody in the, in the streets would love it. But if he liked it, that meant I had to go back in the studio and work it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you have a similar thing with, with Lior? Yeah, Lior. Lior okay. Yeah, Lior would ask me about certain groups, and if it was stuff I, I liked or loved, he'd be like, oh, we can't mess with this. Okay. <laughs> it won't okay. sell. The stuff I hated, he'd be like, yeah, this is the good stuff. But it's interesting because we always dreamed of being on Def Jam, and and um, I don't quite remember exactly why we decided to to, to go with Jive instead. Um, but in like you know, fast forwarding through the years, we weren't we weren't that Def Jam artist mm-hmm. because the, the Def Jam artists to me had like the you know it was just chest beating, braggadocious, hard male figures, you know. So yeah, probably we would we might have. But you know something? You, I, I think you guys could have been. I think De La Soul could have been. De La, a Def Jam artist as well. Yeah. Um, and, but the thing I, I, I think that, that served you well was the fact that since Def Jam was the most envied record company, yeah. that means all the other record companies had to step up their game. Absolutely. And that led to Jive. Yeah becoming, you know, because Jive was not a record label that you see to first. Hmm. They were kind of like, they were like, they were kind of like into hip hop, but they were more into like more of the disco-y side mm-hmm. of hip hop or the, the danceable side of hip hop. Like who else did they have? Uh, well, they, at the time, there was like a, the group called the Willison Dodgers that was out and it was kind of like an electro kind of a thing. Mm-hmm. And um, 
and then and and this was I think this was uh, be, right when KRS when they just picked up KRS, mm -hmm. and and you know KRS the first album that they put out was independent, so they was trying to get into that space because they knew that you know uh, all everybody else was was stepping up their game, right. and um, and so I I think that that's what made them put the energy behind it. Mm. Because you know, record companies, you, you, you know this very well, record companies, people think that record companies push artists. And I think that that's the biggest fallacy. The that opposite. You, well, I, yeah, I think, that the, I think that the artist pulls the record companies. Yeah. And, and, when, and, when, and when the artist has already got street cred, and you guys were already you know, loved and liked on the streets, y'all had, had a great buzz on the streets, and so, so I think it was a it was an easier call for them. Well, I, I love going in, on about that moment, but can <laughs> we just talk about? I want to go back a little bit because you know before there was a tribe called Quest. You know, as a production team, it was the Bomb Squad, and we listened to you guys' records and was just blown away. And just like we we studied like the Beatles, we studied Jimi Hendrix, we studied the Bomb Squad. It was just like how can we make our records great? Like you, you guys, like for us, was the epitome of greatness. Well, I, I, I thank you first of all, I, and and because that that's uh, that's humbling for me. But the but if you think about it, you know, for us, you know, as hip hop, it was more about us. We had something to prove mm -hmm. more than it was that we're trying to make something great. You know, and, and what, what did we have to prove? We had to prove that we were viable enough to make a record on a major label mm -hmm. or any label, you know, because at the time R&B was the day. Right. And, and, and you know that we wasn't, we came from a DJ background, not a, you know, not a musician's background. And if you, and if you think about all the records that were made back then, they were all made by musicians. Right. You know, the producers were musicians, and so everybody talked in language that that was understood. Right. Meanwhile, hip hop had its own language, its own vibration, its own feel, and it was counter what was going on musically. Well, you guys brought something completely different to them. What was happening at the time? I think things were a lot more simplified at the time that you guys stepped on, and you. It was like you, the compositions were just so, it was complex. What, how did you guys, like what led you into creating in that kind of a fashion? Just like you said, uh, everything was simplistic, which is, I think it's good. And, and, if you, and, and if you think about, you know, the music back then, I, I, I looked at it from that everybody had their own corner. Yeah. So to speak, you know, it's like, and none of us stepped on each other's corner. Mm -hmm. So, so if you had like a, you know, let's say a De La Soul that was coming from a kind of like a, 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 a daisy hippie kind of psychedelic kind of vibration with their hip hop, you know, you also had the the LL Cool J coming with this hard aggressive. You had the Run DMC with their little rock edge. Mm -hmm. You had, I mean, we everybody had their little zone. Whether it be Biz Marky was coming from a more of a human humor. Mm -hmm. Angle. So everybody had their angle, and 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 the music was accompanied by that angle. So with, for for us, it was more of a thing where okay, I wanted to prove because I had a love for I had a ridiculous record collection, and I wanted to to prove that that it was the records that inspired me mm -hmm. because I didn't know how to you know. I, I understand scales and musical arrangements and that stuff, but I didn't have an under, I, I was not a player. I'm not going to pick up a bass player or I'm going to pick up a bass or a guitar or keys and I'm, just going, and I'm going to be, you know, put some virtuoso stuff down. That's not going to happen. But what I do have is a turntable and records. Mm -hmm. And so I just want to create this, you know, collage, you know, uh, almost like a Romare Bearden kind of mm -hmm. a, you know, painting. And just be able to take colors and 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 put them in ways that people would not think that those colors should be there, and 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 so when I when I make records and or, or, and it, it's always looked upon as like what kind of what does it look like first? Well, how did that come together? Considering like the technology of now, obviously I think if you could 
push yourself to the future, making the records that you made were probably easier to make now, or maybe not, but the, back then the technology, did the technology create um, more of a challenge that added to the creativity, or was it just you guys just didn't know any, and there were no no rules and no knowns, so you just made and created? Well, yeah, it was no rules, no knowns, but it also added, it also pushed us. Uh, for, and for me, like I said, once you understand that everything comes from the turntable, now everything else becomes, you know, easy. Because it's, it's not about, you know, trying to figure out how to take technology to work. It's about now, uh, how do I make the, the records that are from these records work in a certain arrangement? Mm. And so then you just use whatever. Um, um, bef because before it, there was any... Uh, you know, samplers, because it, people don't realize that the sampling at the time wasn't, when we, when I first did the first record, it wasn't available. Mm -hmm. So we had to kind of like invent that. And right. so, and how do you invent those things? Well, the you know, you remember back to the pause tapes. Yeah. And so what was the pause tapes? We would just take a snip, snatch of the record, pause it, and then and take a, and create a loop out of all the different pauses. So that's how you guys pretty much... It was the first album a pause tape album? <laughs> <laughs> like, well, Public Enemy Number One was created as a pause tape. That's crazy. I never heard this story. And and so and so we had to recre recreate that process in the studio. <laughs> and 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 luckily, you know, it's funny. Luckily, when was it? We went to Def Jam Studios, and at Def Jam Studios, Def Jam recorded at Chung King Studios. Mm -hmm. And Chung King had an engineer named Steve Ett. You've you know probably heard of him. He's Famous, he did all the LL Cool J, Beastie Boys records, everything. And um, he did something that I thought was crazy amazing. He took a two inch tape, recorded the, because at the time, it was, since it was a pause tape, that meant that the, 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 the revolution between the, the loop was a minute and 30 seconds long. And so there was nothing, no equipment that could have gotten to that length. But what we did was we, we recorded onto tape, and then he took the tape and wound it all around the little microphone stands in the room into the, and, and made a big loop wow. out of it. Wow. And, and, so, and so, so this is why when you listen to the record, it, it, it has this little glitch in it. So it goes, mm, mm. And that was, and, and, and that blew my mind because and, and, and it, because it allowed me to be able to, to see how we can take from the pause tape and move it up into a recording studio and get the quality that was needed. And then the rest is just adding the drums and then the vocals and everything else on it. That's crazy. Right, but with all those tracks, so I, I read an interview, I think you gave to Red Bull, which you were talking about, and you have so much up on the board, like nobody has enough hands to pull everything down at the same time when yeah. it needs to. Well, because, because every record has to have a drop. You know, you, it's like every hip hop record, if you didn't have a drop in your hip hop record, it was kind of like, come on, dude, <laughs> all right, you know? And, um, and so and by using all these little samples, and you, you keep in mind that everything had to be 24 track and there was no automation right. back then. So there was times when they would be, we'll have like, four things on one track. Mm -hmm. And that was unheard of in, 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 in recording because usually every instrument has its own track and it runs through the whole song and nothing dared touch that track. Right. But we didn't do that. And keep in mind that in a 24 track week studio, you really can only use 22 tracks because one had to be for the Simpty, yeah. which is 24, and you couldn't record on the 23rd track because the, the, the Simpty would bleed mm -hmm. onto that. So we only had those tracks to work with. And so if you go kick snare, you know, you, you, you go kick snare hi-hat, you know, you already got like four, eight, four, six, eight tracks are just done with drums. Right. So right. now you have to fit in vocals and everything else within, the, within the, the remaining tracks. And so, you know, so it forced us to be able to stack stuff. And then, we, and then by stacking stuff, now we have to kind of like mute things at certain points because we don't want other instruments to come in at the time when it shouldn't come in at. So, so, so for that, and, and, and so that why we needed a lot more hands because if I had, you know, if you have, like, you know, if you have like 
10 instruments on the board, you know, you got, you only really li can use maybe three fingers at a time. You can't use five. So, so you need extra hands. And so one of the things that we had to do was we had to go in and everybody would practice. just be there. practice And it? practice, yeah, and practice <laughs> the drop. And you got to do it all the way through, right? Yeah, well, it, 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 it was almost back to recording live, yeah. you know. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that's why there's so many people in the studio, just in case. Well, yeah, that. Power goes out and you have to go old school. Well, that and the fact that back then, you know, the process needed a lot of hands. Mm -hmm. You know, like today, you know, you know, one man could be at a computer. Right. You know, back then you had an engineer, and the engineer had to have an assistant because somebody had to man the patch bag. Somebody had to had to write down all the controls on on the effects machine that that was being used. And and for 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 us, it was like somebody had to man the turntable. Somebody has to man the sampler. Somebody has to man the drum machine. And while the process is taking all the sounds now and incorporating them in, right. into the track, because a lot of things, you, you, you know, like when you're making samples, a lot of things don't fit yeah. where you want it to yeah. fit, you know, because you're using a, 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 a finite piece of music that you can't change. Yeah. So, so if you want to get that impact or that emotion or whatever that you want to get, you have to now search through maybe a hundred different things. And that's where the, you know, and people don't realize it's very time consuming it, in order to do that. It's still, still that way in terms of like um, going through like your drum sounds and your, drum, your, your keyboard patches. And I mean, these days you have like, instead of a room full of keyboards, you just have a computer filled up with different, you know, mod keyboard modifications. And you're looking through string sounds and it could be like 5,000 like violin sounds. And, and so you're just looking for that little something, that little element, which is time consuming and some kind of, sometimes can kill the creativity. But I would imagine that what you guys were doing was it didn't kill the creativity. I'm pretty sure it was ex exciting because it was new, wasn't happening before. What was sample clearances like? There was no sample clearances then, was there? Well, no, because nobody, we was doing something that was below the radar. And, and, but, but, but see, you, you point out a very interesting point when you said about the, you know, uh, you know having the this, this sounds and everything together. And one of the things that, that was, was key to me was I did, we did Rebel Without a Pause on, on what is known as the uh, Mirage, the Insonic Mirage. And, and the Mirage was, a, at the time, a four-bit sampler, right? And all you got was three seconds. And, and what, it, but what four bits does in, in, in the keyboard version, it gave it a grit that you didn't have. I remember when John King first brought in the, the S900. Mm -hmm. And when he brought in the S900, it, it, was, tw it was, at the time, eight bits. The first one was eight, and then it moved up to 12. Oh, 12. Um, yeah. um, and, and, and then later, of course, they moved up. Yeah, as they, yeah. But, the, uh, but the first one was eight, and that eight bit made it sound too neat, too shiny, too correct. It sounded more like the record was. And I didn't like that record, like that, so I went back to the to the four bit version of it and printed that and that's what made it, gave it that texture. And, and, and these are the things that, and that just taught me a lot about equipment. You know, like a lot of people think that when you're dealing with equipment, you wanna, you wanna get the best resolution. You wanna get the highest amount of bandwidth or whatever the case is that you're looking for. And I'm like, mm, sometimes not so because it's all about working with, the, with gear. And when you work with gear, you can use anything. Yeah. Well, you were just telling us a story earlier about why the 808 exists and why it doesn't anymore, really. Yeah, and, and, and it was funny because, you know, it, I, I don't know if I want to give the, 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 the ending of the movie. We just did a documentary on the 808. And I was talking to you guys about, you know, why the machine is no longer in existence. And it's funny, is it, and, 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 and you figure out, okay, well, why is it not in existence? Well, they only made 12,000 of them. And, they, and it was only a three-year three year run. But it's, it had a lot to do with the transistors. Mm -hmm. The transistors were faulty, and they're no longer faulty anymore. And so, and so there's, a, there's something, uh, there's a character 
inside of, of things that don't work well. Yeah. And, and, and you, all the greatest drum machines that we all love and use all were guilty of yeah. those faults. Yeah. Well, that's just like humans, you know, there's ac aspects that people of our persona that someone may look at and go, that's imperfect, but no, it's perfect. You know, there's, there's a beauty in something that someone else can't, you may not see it, but there's something else that exists within us and it helps us to create and do things. It, you, in terms of um, technology, you've always been interested in, in the movement of, of technology. Oh, um, I mean, we all are, you know, it, it, because see, one of the things I find that that with hip hop, you know, hip hop and and the, and all the producers and the people that made hip hop has never gotten credit for being an elect. We're in the electronic music industry, yeah. you know. They they call it hip hop, and I'm sitting there saying, well, what they they completely disregard the fact that we're all doing everything electronically. And so thus we're looking for any machine that gives us the sounds. You know, the 808, for example. You know, what do we do with the 808? We increase the decay on it mm -hmm. and get that crazy sustain and the crazy rumble. And what is that doing? That's actually wrong. Because what it's doing, we're taking low end, we're putting it on the record, and it's distorting the speakers. Mm -hmm. It's also, it's also bad for the vinyl, because vinyl can't handle that. But we didn't care anyway. We wanted to feel that bottom end. And, and, and for us doing that, the whole culture of subwoofers been created just for that purpose. Because before there was no subwoofers, we used to have to try to get bass out of a, out of a, uh, a you know, six inch speaker. And you can't get bass out of a six inch speaker, but, but you but you want to push the envelope so much so that you can feel something. And that brought on the advent of no, we need something low. And even the studios had to readopt for the for all the hip for the hip hop vibrations when, when Katz was making these records because now they had to put subs in the studios. Right. And so so the technology, we was always pushing the technology forward. Even when the when the advent of the turntable, when when the techniques move from 6% pitch to 8, you know, and then to t 9 and 10, you know, so, so, and people sit there and say, well, what, what has that, why does that have to do anything? Well, when you, you know, when you're yeah, mixing when, records. Or when you're trying to, especially back then, um, you, because your sampler only had like four seconds, so you like put it on forty-five to just get okay. get more of the beat and and, 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 and pitch and pitch, pitch it, it faster. <laughs> exactly, just to get as much more seconds out of what you need to get. Yeah. And so, tech, we we've learned to hip hop has been made from the distortion and and of technology. We would tra create, you know, and I don't mean by just verbally just distorting it, but I'm talking about using it in ways that the manufacturers never intended it to be used. You know, for the example, the perversion of it. In exactly. Yeah. You know, for example, the, the 1200. You know, the the SB 1200 was meant as a percussion machine. So, so mean, meaning that you put a a bass drum, snare drum, hi hat, toms, and it, and it gave you eight slots for that. It was never meant to take a record <laughs> and put it through there and play record hits or, or record patterns or, or bass notes or bass lines out of it. And that changed the expression of it because it, it, in, it, even in the 1200s, there was a thing where when they, when they took the hi-hat, they would have the hi-hat and the open hi-hat. And those were the only two patterns that cut each other off. Mm -hmm. All right, so if you want to do, as a real drummer, a real drummer can't play an open hi-hat and a closed hi-hat at the same time. So what happens is, is that when you play the open hi-hat, something's got to trigger it to, 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 to cut off. And so they would, they were, those were the only two pads there. So what now what we do, we would say two things that we want to put on there. And now the, the motion of, of having one sample cutting off another sample creates a new rhythm, a new vibration, a new frequency. Now we're like, Okay, and that's what hip hop is about. It's about the hotness of it, and what it, it, a lot of cats don't understand that it's more about the 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 on, the off mm. than it is on the on. Yeah. You know, yeah. so so these are things, and that that caused us to understand the truncation. Mm -hmm. So now the truncation can't be like it can't be perfect. Lessons being given, <laughs> you kids don't really understand 
everything is made so easy these days. Is there anything that has been created, maybe let's say in the, the past five years, that's really fascinated you in music instrumentation? Oh, I, I have to say the computer, man. I mean, and, and the reason why I'm saying that is because the things that I'm hearing, you know, first, you know, the, when I first like took a kind of like a, a break off of like like heavy making music I said I gotta get back because after a while when you start making keep constantly making music and with the pressures that 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 it takes to to make these to make these records you lose a certain perspective mm. and you start to get detached from the the, the the sound itself and so now instead of you hearing something as one whole feeling you're now hearing a, all the separates mm -hmm. and so nothing is really gelling and no matter what arrangements what you do what you put up you all you're hearing is these separates but you're never hearing it as one vibration mm -hmm. that's when you know you have to take a step back because that's it's, you have to clear your head mm -hmm. and then come back again so it's okay to take a break and then come back and, and, and when I took a break from making records, I, I don't listen to other records while I'm making records because I don't want to be influenced right. because I'm a, I'm a fan first. I, I love everybody's music. So I'll listen to this and I'll be like, oh, I want to change. When I listen to something, I want to change again. So in order for me to stay focused, I have to now like devoid myself from listening to anything outside and, and zone in on what I'm doing. Yeah. And when you do that, you tend to like put your head in the sand and you don't hear and know and feel what's going on out there. So when you stick your head up, you've missed a period of time that you wasn't listening to anything. And so I went back now and started listening to stuff. And, and when I started listening, the first thing I picked up was I said, I want to listen to drum and bass. Hmm. Because when, when I was, when my head was in the thing, I, I missed that whole era. And so I started listening to drum and bass and I started hearing, like I said, oh, this is hip hop sped up. Hmm. And not only that, the intricacy of the of how they use the 808s to create bass lines. Mm -hmm. and, then, and then from that, I'd start, I, I started listening to a, another version of it, and I, and I got this tape by accident. I happened to, it was not a tape, it was actually a CD. I got it by accident, and it was the roots of dubstep. And it was like, and I'm, and I'm listening to this thing, and I'm sitting there going like, I thought it was a drum and, I thought it was drum and bass. I thought it was a, a subgenre of drum and bass. But when I listened to it, it was a little slower. Mm -hmm. And, but it was a little funkier, mm -hmm. a little wonkier. Mm. That's a <laughs> and, good word for it. You know, and, 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 it was, and it was hot. And I was just like, I was like, whoa, what, what is this feeling? And so I started investigating it. And then I started finding out all the artists and different cats that was making it. And it piqued my interest again. Once again, it's about finding something that piques your interest. Mm -hmm. And so... I started listening to, now I'm listening to dance music again. I'm listening to techno. And why am I listening to techno? Because I've never been a fan of, of mainstream commercial pop music. Never. Like, like people sit there and say, well, okay, come on, come on, come on. But my favorite, my, the album I, 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 I like the least is Michael Jackson's Thriller. I was thriller. just going to ask you about, I'm like, what about <laughs> Michael Jackson? That was the first thing that popped into my head. And, and you, you know why. Because, yeah. because off the wall to me is my holy grail. Right. And, but, but what happened with, with, with Thriller, it became a commercial phenomenon. And to me, right then, it loses its appeal. So you got the instant I can't. I can't accept that when I, I can't once it once it go, once it crosses over crazy. I, I'm like nah. Like on principle, like it's not even about the sound. It's not even about. It's like it's just be. be it's kind of egotistical in a way because I kind of feel like if everybody likes it, then it then 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 it's it's obviously not good. Right. Right. <laughs> but but I identify with that too. Okay. Yeah. And you always want to make that cool new thing. Yeah, I think as I don't know if it's a DJ thing too because you know the DJs like it's easy for, if everyone else is playing that one particular song it's like cool but as a DJ it's like you want to be like yo I found this cut, you know, that's going to shock and awe you like you're going to be like where that come from? Who's that? Be like, well, that's on this same record that you all, you know. Okay. So maybe there's a little bit of that. In. I mean, I and, and, but, and, but, that's the, but that to me is the embryo of producing. Yeah. 
because you 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 want to be first and you want to see if if the if if your taste is going to emerge. When I when I the, when I first got my first vinyl of it's like that mm. by you know Run DMC. We're gonna go back. This is history class. We're gonna go back. Mm -hmm. um, every they was pushing it's like that so hard that I was like, mm. I happened to flip it over, and I saw this little record. It was like oh, this little record. It was a few minutes long. It was Sucker MCs. Mm. Just the title alone just made me want to like, what are they talking about? So I played that first. Now keep in mind that I'm getting the promotion of vinyl before it got the radio or any place. And so I'm playing Sucker MCs and, I'm, and the first thing I hear is that beat. And from that point on, I was like, this is the record. So I started programming that record. And we was playing that record on BAU and all the other, you know, at the college stations as much as possible. And every time I went out, I was playing that record. And that record blew up on Long Island. Mm. And so from that point, you know, and then to see how that record then led to it becoming big on, on radio. Right. And, and, and when you think about it, a lot of people don't, in New York don't really remember it's like that. And that was the A side. And the B side was Suck MCs. And so that spawned me to, uh, that's why we wrote the song B side wins again. Mm. Because the B side has always been the tune that was hot. You talking about the pressures of making music. Can you talk a little bit more about that? I mean, because is it about outdoing yourself? Or is it about staying in shape? Or is it about Getting what you want out? It's both. It's in all of the above, all at the same time. Yeah. And so that's what makes it pressure. Because you have to be, you have to outdo yourself, right? Yeah. From what you did before. Otherwise, people are going to say, well, he did that already. Yeah. And then you have to, you have to kind of like go, okay, well, now how can I do something that's going to be different? But you can't be too different. You want to be classic. You want to do something retro, but you can't be too retro. So there's these balancing acts that you have to play, and that's where the pressure comes from. Yeah. The pressure comes from you, and, and keep in mind that when you're making a record, it's like you're naked. You stand on the table naked, and you and you giving somebody your all. You saying, "Well, this is my baby right here. What do you think?" And then now people have their, and people are hard out there. You know, they're like, "Ah, that baby's whack," <laughs> <laughs> and your whole existence now gets crushed. Yeah. And, and, and your career could be, can, is hinging on, on these decisions. And so thus, it's, it's, it's spawned a lot of the hip hop artists and you know, we took it amongst ourselves. We, we, we would never rely on a, a, a committee, a con, almost like a congressional committee or some kind of like tribunal that would sit there and say, mm, we're not really feeling this record, so this record's not coming out. Mm -hmm. What would we do? We will go out, Put it, I'll give it and play it to cats. Yeah. Okay, yeah. and 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 why do we do that? To create a balance of power. Yeah. So now the record companies can't that that tribunal that's sitting there going like, this is not good enough for us to come out. Now has to listen to other voices, and when they hear other voices that's screaming at them like, what are y'all crazy? Then all of a sudden now things start to change, and I and I can give you an example of that. Uh, there was a there's a soundtrack that I did called Juice, mm -hmm. and there was a record. There was a record that, that there was a, there was a part in the movie that was the most significant part. It was in the house. It was in the house, and it was a, it was a party scene. And there was a there was a there was a it was a key place for a good record, a big record, but a big hip hop record. And but it had to be a big hip hop underground record. So I heard this record from Cypress Hill called Killer Man. And now, at the time, Cypress Hill was signed to, to Columbia, and they were, they were kind of like not feeling this group or didn't know what to do with this group because Columbia did not understand hip-hop at the time at all. So they were like, what do we do with this group? Should we, should we drop them? So they were in limbo until I put that record in the Juice movie. And once that record was in the Juice movie, all of a sudden, there was an interest now. Mm. That the, and now the fans spoke, 
and the record company had to follow right along with it. You had to hear that song loud in a theater. Exactly. Get out of here. It was, yeah. So and so that and that's 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 what we go through, and 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 at that time, you know, the the, the beautiful thing about hip hop, and and at that moment was that we would all do that for each other. We, we never had this thing of, even though that we were competitive, we were competitors about the product. Absolutely. But we were never haters. Yeah. It's like, and there's a difference. And, and a, it's a, a hater is somebody that will hear something that's crazy incredible, you know it's dope, but you, in your heart, you gonna say you don't like it because you don't wanna see this thing evolve. Right. That's hating. We wouldn't do that. When you guys made Bonita Applebaum, we were sitting there going like, oh my God, can we believe this? But at the same time as we're competitive, mm-hmm. we, got, we, rec- we have to stand back and go, this record's crazy. Mm-hmm. I, would listen to the, I had to listen to the record a few times and I sit there and go like, I had to go back and go, you know what? It's official. And we would do that. That doesn't happen much today. Yeah, why not? What changed? Well, the economics change. Yeah. You know, it's like, it's now, now there's an economic, you know, uh, uh, side to the music game that changes your perception of it. Because there's less money, so well, people or, have to be play it safe. Or there's more greed. You know, it's like, oh, I don't want you to, I can't have you shine because if you shine, that means I ain't good. Right. And so now I got to hold you back. And what that does is that that distorts the music. Yeah. It, it doesn't allow the music to evolve. That's why. Why do you think everybody says that the, 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 80s, the, the 80s era to from, from anywhere from, the, from 89 to 95-ish is the golden era? Why? Because we didn't hate. Mm-hmm. And, and another thing that we had was we didn't bite each yeah. other. If you had a zone and you had a, a lane, you stay in it. I, I don't think the kids these days are going to get that message and they don't care. They see that as a, a badge of honor, actually. you know, Fighting? For, yeah. Are you kidding me? All the music that's successful now. And I, I, I'll go as, into even the technology, mm-hmm. and it, which adds to it. It's like you can go to many websites now and they all have like templates made. Let's just go on and trap um, subgenre of hip hop. And there will be like a thousand templates, and all you gotta do is drag that into your 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 application you use them, be it Logic, Ableton, whatever. Um, change you know a couple of drum sounds, mm-hmm. and now your, your sketch is the same. It's the same, and you got somebody else who hopefully will bring in a different uh, rap style or rap cadence to to change the dynamic of the vocal on top. But in terms of the foundation of it, it's just like. No one's there's there there are people who are thinking, but it just seems like there's such a a, a a desire to make it big so fast that you you choose the quick and easy route, yeah. and so that kills the music a little bit, and then uh, if there's success with it and continued uh, repeated success, I think that the kids again they see it as a badge of honor. It's just like well you know. I'm, I'm gonna keep going here. Why change it? I'm finding success with this. Well, and that extends over even to the mixtape, you know, today, and that, which I don't understand. The mixtape is like I don't understand a, a new rapper getting on top of another rapper's instrumental to get out there and to and to put that out there. And, and I'm sitting there going like, well, I understand it from a marketing standpoint where you want people to listen to it because they want to listen to something that they're familiar with. But at the same time, what you're doing is you're destroying your, your, your essence because now no one knows who you are. Yeah. And so, and, and you make, to me, or the second thing that you're doing is that you're creating a ceiling for yourself. So if you're on top of a, you know, I don't know, a Kanye beat, for example, well, how could you be better than Kanye? Well, that's some, I don't know, that's a, that's a, I, I kind of see it. I, I see your point in that, mm-hmm. and I, I kind of look at it as then having like I don't know twelve MCs from back in the eighties rhyming on heartbeat. 
It's almost the same. Maybe in a party sensation and not not necessarily to... to I'm, yeah, I'm talking about distributing. Yeah, distribu- right. distribution is, yeah, totally, yeah, I don't get that. If, if, you, if, you, if you were to put your first record out with someone else's music on it, yeah, no, you how would, where would you be? Yeah. You would be, you would be. First of all, you'd be looked upon like as a, a clone of something else, and forget about what that something is, because we can, we can get, we can put our egos inside this and say, well, I don't want to get on a Kanye beat just because it's Kanye. It's not because you're getting on that because it's Kanye. It's because it's not yours. Yeah. And what, and, and and so, and 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 everything that we come from is funny. Where everything we come from comes from the fact from Tila Rock when he says, "It's yours." It needs to be yours. So we want to make sure that, that you create your identity. And it doesn't matter what your identity is, because now today you got cats that are afraid of their identity. So, you know, you know, David Banner said one time in an interview, he was like, you know, man, I want to do some classical vibes and, and, and put some stuff in, in, in some of my music. And he was afraid to because he said, yo, people won't accept it. Why? So why are we now... As producers now, now, as a producer, what we're supposed to be is providing what the public doesn't get. I feel like we're probably now at that point where that's going to be broken because it was the, for the value of chasing the money. But I think now where the the whole entire globe is, is going in the direction that we're going, that there's a, a vibration of trying to reconnect with one another because there's been such a, a disconnect. And even in the creative aspect, it's like you're in the room with your computer. Like there is not a lot of connecting and mm-hmm. people coming together. So I feel like people are looking to do something a little bit different. And, you know, like we, we talked about Kendrick, the mm-hmm. Kendrick Lamar album. I think he's definitely like stamping that. Uh, oh no doubt individuality and and togetherness and unity um in that um but do you think that that's because everything is not working or is it see 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 there's a difference you know it's like we didn't do it because it wasn't working we did it because this is this is what you aspire to be right you want to right. be great, right. and you want to be great in your own right. That's why, that's why you know, you're great at what you do, and I'm great at what I do. There's no best here. There's only greatness. Well, I think that's just the distraction of uh, intent and what you wanted to get out of it, and it's just fame and fortune for a lot of people, mm-hmm. or in the means to, to, to change, the, change the environment and maybe not necessarily for the art aspect of it. So mm-hmm. it was just to... This is my, my, my ticket out the ghetto, you know, and not like, I'm creating art. I don't care where it takes me, okay. you know. And I feel like people, we're, we're finally getting back to that art is important, you know. And being, being a creative person means that you take these risks. And, mm-hmm. and so I feel like that's, uh, I, I don't know, time will tell. I feel like we're about to. Oh, we're we going to, we definitely, it, it, because it can't go anywhere else. I mean, think about, I first had the tape of Tim, Timbaland's beats before he even started working, when he was just starting to work with Missy, and they were starting, to, they was writing, writing for Aaliyah's first record, all right? I had his beats. Nobody liked his beats. Nobody. They were like, the, his beats was getting rejected all over the planet from artists and everything else. His beats were hot to death to me the minute I, I heard them. Because what he was doing was this triplet style, almost drum and bass but slowed down for on an R&B level. And that right there was something unique and different. And he stood on his grounds. And, and what he did was, was masterful, got Missy to write to him. Once he, once that combination went down, the the, 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 the the now the beast is now being tamed. And so now, now all they need is an, an artist. Barry Hankerson put them over with Aaliyah, who was trying to figure it out, who was at that time a clone because she was an R and B, I mean a R. Kelly protege, found a whole new identity from that collaboration. So this is the, 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 the power of, of, of individuality. This is the power of, of doing things, being your own, and, and staying away from the norm. What about the idea, though, of, of paying homage or 
like incorporating something older because you love it so much and you respect it so much and you want it to be a part of your work. And then, but uh, there's too much nostalgia, I think, for the 90s. Sorry, guys. But like, <laughs> but it's a weird. It's great. <laughs> it's a weird nostalgia because these kids were born in the 90s. Like they didn't, mm-hmm. they don't know it. Mm-hmm. So, but is there anything positive in that, like the love for that time, like that, the resurgence of Missy, that kind of thing? Well, I mean, just because you know you haven't been born in it doesn't mean that you can't know it. I mean, to today we have so many different ways of you to explore stuff yeah. from yesterday. Um, and I think that that's healthy. Uh, the same thing is like, do you want to see the same movie over and over? It's like, it's like, you know, I saw Planet of the Apes, the new one, and now I'm seeing the next one, and now I'm seeing the next one. It's like, okay, okay. can we do something new? And I think that and when someone comes with something that's original, listen, originality is always going to trump the clone. Sure. Let's, let's understand that. And, and because, because, because what we're saying is, and deep down, is that we're not good enough. Yeah. I'm not good enough to make a record better than this record that was in the past, so I'm going to rely on the past to create my new future. Mm-hmm. <laughs> no. I mean, it worked for a moment. When I heard, you know, when you said the, the love for the 90s, there was a part of the 90s that I really didn't love. When, when I heard a, a, a Mace record who took Hollywood swinging from the, from the cool in the gang and looped it. <laughs> and now, now I'm, I'm listening to this, I'm listening to them put a rap on it. And, I'm, and the first thing that's screaming from my head is, no. <laughs> I went into a club and saw her respond and I had to go like, all right. <laughs> so and, and and you're right. There is. I mean, there's a. It's a. It's a fine line. And 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 in creativity, I don't want to sit here and sound like that's not good. But I. But I also want to, want people to understand that the other is also as good. Because what's happening is that we're starting to make kids that have their own sensibility in music that wants to do take do something that's challenging. We're giving them a complex. Yeah. By saying, oh, you can't do this. You got to be like this person back over here. And they're saying, well, I'm not that person. Why, am, why do I have to emulate that? Mm-hmm. And so that's why you're, when you're saying now that you're seeing, yeah, the walls are being broke down yeah. because the, it, it got so bad that, it, that the only place that it can go is up. Mm-hmm. So now you're going to see, to me, the, 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 the game is just, the music business is just beginning. And people will sit there and be like, hmm, Hank, what do you mean by that? Well, what do I mean by that is that the old business, the old record paradigm is, is, is over with. So now what's happening is creativity is allowed to flourish. And why is creativity allowed to flourish? We have, we have tools like Mixcloud, SoundCloud. We mm-hmm. have YouTube. We have ways of getting things out that we didn't have before. Yeah. And so now that we're just in the, I, I call it we're in Web 2.0. This whole thing, being down in South by to me, is the next incarnation of the web. And, and, and what, I'm, what I mean by this, there's one thing when we invent the cell phone and we say, okay, you got a cell phone, then you got a cell phone, but you're in a minority. That's one, that's one means of, you, we can look at that as, as a, 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 a means of revolutionary process. Okay. But there's another thing that happens when everybody in the room has a cell phone. Mm-hmm. Now some new things start to develop. We start communicating now. Now we start innovating on how we're communicating to each other. Mm-hmm. Well, this thing is just starting. The rest of the world is just starting to get broadband. Mm-hmm. Right. And when that starts to happen, now what about the com- communication of collaborations? I'm here with the cats from Brazil. I'm here with the cats from Africa. And now we talk, now we can sit there and we don't have to worry about distances being our, being our enemy, so to speak, or, or, or our Achilles heel. Now we can collaborate on the net. And now you're starting to hear music now that's reflective of so many different influences. Mm-hmm. I heard a, a, a band from Mali who was, who was playing blues. And people sit there and say, yeah. and it's like, what do they know about blues? They destroyed blues better than any music, any blues band I've heard and hear. Go back to you have to you have to go back to like John Lee Hooker and them to be like mm, okay. Mm-hmm. Wow. 
So, so this is, and these guys are, don't, don't even know who he is, really. Because, you know, so they, so, so, and they're all like 19, 20, 21. You got kids that are destroying classical music now with electronic music. So we're opening up new avenues of expression. Look at the whole uh, uh, brain feeder posse mm. and what they've done. What, what, if you want to talk about Public Enemy 2.0 or Bomb Squad 2.0, that to me is, the, is, is, is that zone. They've taking, they're taking the, the music and twisting it and bending it in so many different ways that coming up with a whole new expression. And they're coming up with a def an expression that defies every musical reference and, 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 and book and everything that we've studied about it and still making it hot. Yeah, I mean, it's like without gatekeepers, I mean, I think about it in terms of music journalism and how there were, you used to have to pass a certain bar or, or a critic would have to approve you or you get a grade or whatever, or they help you to interpret it. And um, mm -hmm. now I kind of think we don't, we don't need that. We don't need that anymore. We don't need a review. We don't need anybody to write about it if we just get in a room and talk about it. And that might be a revolution of communication, a revolutionary process in the way that you're talking about. If we all have access to the music and the language to talk about it and the, the means to get to each other, then we're good. We don't need an expert. Okay. And, and, that's, and that's, a, that's a very good point. And, and, and so we don't need people telling us what the, the, the top eight at eight or the top oh. ten. It's like that's passe now. It's like it's like when somebody puts in there like you know who's your favorite you know what's the top ten rappers, somebody's going to be left off. That's yeah. dope. Mm -hmm. Right. And so now and and, be, and and the age that we're in with the age of the the i the iPod the iPhone and all the other you know devices that you have and I, I don't want to keep using one one label one but I'm a, I've been a Mac user since the '80s so I don't know any other one. <laughs> <laughs> so the so um it made us genre less mm. intelligent. We I don't know what music is called today. Mm. Right. It's like I'll listen to something and I'll be like, he will say, well, what do you think that is? It has a four on the floor. It's funky. It's soulful. It's a, it's a, it's bluesy. It's classical. It's, it's got it's all. They'll have all these elements in it. It's jazzy. So now we can do new forms of expression. Mm -hmm. When you see Daft Punk, who is an electronic band, gets with Nile Rodgers and puts Pharrell on it, like what? <laughs> and that record works. And why does it work so big? It's because of the fact that they took that and pushed the envelope. And so my thing is all about just pushing the envelope. It doesn't matter about time. Because it's, to me, from far as I'm concerned, there's no such thing as time. Time is an illusion. Yeah. There's still power in some labels, though, right? Like, calling something hip-hop is still meaningful. And calling something R&B is still... And, like, and then sometimes the distinction between it and pop... But sometimes it's, it, it, it's deceiving. Yeah. Because somebody, somebody went to me and told me that this person was a hip-hop artist. I listened to it and said, no, I wasn't hip-hop. You just killed it. Well, like we were talking about Stromae earlier. Right. So is he hip-hop? Is he dance? <laughs> yeah. He, <he's... laughs> I think so. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's French. Exactly. Right. No, Belgian. Uh, Belgian. My bad. Yeah. And... and <laughs> So, so to me, that's what music is, should be about. I don't, I'm not, I don't want, I'm not, I don't look at Ali Shaheed as a, as hip hop. I look at him as, as an artist. Yeah. And whatever he brings me is, comes from him. I don't care what it is. You come with a dance beat. And see, the, 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 the thing that we don't have in, with, with the gatekeepers is that respect. Mm. The respect is, dude, I respect your vision so much. If you gave me a bluegrass record, I'm like, I'm listening Rocking to it. it. Yeah. Okay, I'm, I'm like, yo, we got to put this out. This is incredible. It's a bluegrass record from Ali Shaheed. This is amazing. And, and that right there is what's going to get the buzz. Right. Because people's now going to want to hear it. And that creates, that's interest. We don't have that anymore because everything is the same old thing. Mm -hmm. So where's the interest come from? It's like, oh, okay. 
here's another girl that looks good. She's thin. She looks good. She's light skinned. She can sing. Uh, and she can dance. Okay. <laughs> where's the where's the so so a girl comes, big girl, bigger girl. I don't want to use the other word, but she has she's singing R and B. She's white. She sells 10 million records, <laughs> 20 million records from London. What? So white, not, not skinny and dancing and selling records? Why does that happen? Jasmine Sullivan should have got all that money. I mean, we can always say what should have and could have and whatever it is like on Monday or Monday after the Sunday game. <laughs> yeah, that's true. But the key to this is being able to call it before. Yeah. There were great songs on that album, so, you know. What, Adele or Jasmine? Both. Yeah. Yeah. Can, can I change the topic a little bit? Because you've been in the business a long time. Mm -hmm. What can you tell the up-and-coming, aspiring artists about, uh, I mean, there's the obvious... Um, direction and maybe individuality and those sorts of things but in terms of like um sustaining oneself in the music business for a long time you know like maybe inside or outside of the music what what has it been for you you you're so energetic and you're you're into technology film media and the merging of you know just creative contents the first thing i for me for young artist is 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 the thing that that we all had when we first started out when we were younger is having faith and i think that that you know, we're moving into spiritual concepts because i'm not i can't tell you how to make your music i can't tell you what you know what to what you should be proficient in or any of that other stuff because all that's irrelevant the thing that you have to have is faith in yourself and in your abilities. And I think that, that what, what happens, what, what I see is so many people, so many talented people that are amazingly, like you, and you've seen a bunch of the talented people, and you've listened to a bunch of people who are talented and ridiculously crazy, and you sit there and say, well, why didn't they make it? Mm. What happened? And, 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 and what usually happens is, is if you're really passionate about what you want to do, then you find a way. If you got to work two jobs at night to make your music during the day, then you have to do that. Yeah. And you have to have that conviction and that passion. And what we see now is that the passion is gone, the conviction is gone, the minute somebody tells somebody, oh, your, your stuff is whack. Mm -hmm. It's like, to me, that's the beginning. That's the beginning of the fight. It's like because it's, it's, it's assumed the music that you make or, or whatever you art that you make or whatever it is that you write or whatever it is that you do is already presumed whack. It's presumed whack coming out the gate. Now, the question is, is how are you going to turn that no into a yes? That's your job. And, and, and too, too much of our jobs are, are, are spent on, on sulking about what we don't have and not about what we do have. Yeah. So, I mean, that's the only advice I can give to like anybody, any kind of creator, whether you're creating an app or whatever, is that you need to, you, you want, you have to stay on, you skillful, mm -hmm. you know that, like we're all ninjas. You have to have to work out in the gym, you know, no different than LeBron right, is, is shooting jump shots right now. Mm -hmm. Before the game, he's just in his gym. He got a gym in his house. Well, if you don't have that, then you can't even begin to, to, to compete. But the, the, the main thing that you have to have is the will and the desire to become greater than LeBron. Mm -hmm. Well, I love my job. <laughs> Thank you so much for spending time with us. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Thank you, friend. Thank you, Holly, for having me, man. I really appreciate it. And um, to your audience, man, this is a great platform, and I think everybody should be listening and tuning in. And if you're not tuning in, then you better start tuning in. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, man. Thank you so much. Of course.
No, you're like she turned it down. She was like, "No, you're not." And I was like, so hot, like whether I am or not, like I'm just singing the song, like turn the shit back up. I don't care about. And then when it happened, I was like, "Yo, yo." <laughs> <laughs> I called her. I remember I was in Europe. I was like, "Yo." I talked to her for like three hours. Like, yo, I'm grown. <laughs> it doesn't stop. <laughs>